Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. And we're here with Brother Kyle today, Brother Alberson, at his lovely bungalow here in our town of Claycross in Derbyshire. It's a beautiful sunny day for a change, no rain. And I'm going to kick us off with a prayer. Uh, the reason for today is for our sacrament, and uh, Kyle's going to read from the prayer that Jesus shared with the disciples as we partake of our ambulance. So hopefully you've got your ambulance ready, as we have. And uh, let me kick off and invite the Spirit of God to be with us. Well, Carl's going to light the peace candle. Okay. So let us pray, brothers and sisters. Loving Creator God, we thank you for this time and we ask that thy spirit be with us that uh, you will watch everything we do as we take the sacrament in remembrance of your gift to us, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we pray also that there be peace with us at this time. But we also pray for the world as well, that there be peace in the world and that we can be part of that peace. If we have peace in our own hearts, we can share peace. So, Lord, we ask that your spirit be with us. And I say these things in your wonderful gift to us, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Hello, brothers and sisters. Today, I'm doing the lesson of the sacrament from the Holy Bible, the King James Version. At this time, we welcome all present to Christ's table. We invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of Jesus Christ, in whose name we worship. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament, a time to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to His mission, to grow closer to Jesus Christ as individuals and as a community, worshipping Jesus Christ through God's Word, the sacraments, ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. So if you'd like to bow your heads, kneel, whatever you're able to do, and uh, as Carl prepares to say the prayer, over to Carl. Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. We thank you, Carl, for that prayer for the bread, and we prepare for the, the prayer for the wine. Brothers and sisters, he then said, Then he took up the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So, brothers and sisters, we've all partaken of the sacrament if we pause and think about what Jesus did for us. Sean, brothers and sisters, welcome to this week's Sabbath service. The topic of this week is taking the Book of Mormon's word. And we're going to start by reading a scripture. This is from Joel 2.28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. I hope you had an opportunity to 
share in conference with us that is available online currently on YouTube. It's about an hour and a half long. I found their messages incredibly moving, and I think you will too. So I, I hope you take a take the opportunity to watch that. And if you don't want to miss any of the videos on this channel, please be sure to click to subscribe. So a lot of people, when they think of the Book of Mormon, they think of a church. And that really depends what church stands on where you live. For most people where I live in the United States of America, that is the Salt Lake City Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And although, you know, on, on I don't know what to call them, um, more um, controversial shows, the the, uh, the ones that are trying to shock people, you know, um, they'll get some of the uh, fundamental polygamists on there and show people dressing in incredibly conservative attire. And I don't, I don't mean that in a bad way. It just it just is what it is. It's very very conservative. Um, some of them dress like pioneers from the 1800s, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I want to be very clear. But growing up where I did, Little House on the Prairie was very popular, and so my mom and my sister would sometimes dress like that, and people just assumed that, that was how all Mormons dressed. Um, well, the, the women anywhere anyway, not necessarily the men, because my dad wore a suit, just like most. Salt Lake City church members, uh, and my brothers and I just dressed like people from the 80s. I'm not sure on a social level today which would look more awkward, dressing like you live in the 80s where we were fighting a constant battle against the wind, you can Google that if you'd like, or dressing like you're from the 1800s. Uh, neither fit in very well in today's social climate is what it is. But when you move on to other places, um, Missouri is a great example. There's a lot of different Latter-day branches, Latter-day Saint branches, and they all use the Book of Mormon. And I've talked to many of them who use this tactic where it's like, you know, read the Book of Mormon, pray on it. Well, now, now as you've prayed on this, you should know that you need to join our church because you know the Book of Mormon is true. And either, you know, community Christ doesn't do this anymore, but it used to be you know, our prophet is Joseph Smith's. Uh, descendants, so therefore we're the right ones. The Brighamites will be, you know, we're the largest one or we're the only one, depending on who you're talking to. So therefore you got to join us and, and so on and so forth. And, and because the Brighamites are so large, a lot of the smaller churches end up spending a lot of time preaching against the Brighamites. And actually, the Book of Mormon is true. Here's why you don't want to join the Salt Lake City Church. But my issue with all that is, and, and I could talk for, for hours about it, about that about that topic in general, but that's not what this is about. But I will quickly tell you, because I, I want to lead into the actual message. My problem with that is that there's nothing in the Book of Mormon that tells you to go and join a church. Growing up in the Salt Lake City Church, the one of the prophets said that the Book of Mormon brings people to Jesus Christ, and the Doctrine and Covenants brings people to the Salt Lake City Church. Except that the Salt Lake City Church has like maybe one revelation, I think it's one revelation, one dream, and then two official declarations in it. So really, it's just the book of Joseph Smith, the Doctrine and Covenants, if you will. Um, so I, I don't know why that would necessarily bring you to that particular branch of the faith, because lots of churches have the Doctrine and Covenants. So at the end of the day... <clears throat> Well, at the end of the day, though, I, I do have to agree with him in saying that the Book of Mormon brings people to Jesus Christ. As someone who served for a very, very long time as a ward and stake missionary for that particular church, though, I don't know anybody that ever brought out the Doctrine and Covenants to convert people. Although I will say that the one convert baptism that I did, the Book of Mormon didn't really do anything for her. It was the Doctrine and Covenants that converted her. But it converted her to the Latter-day Saint theology not to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There's a lot of things, even after she got baptized, that she was very, very against, and she, at times, would be vocal about that. And, and I, I applaud her for that. You know, that, that's how we should be. If we don't agree with something, we should be allowed to speak up. So why, then, do these churches use the Book of Mormon to bring people to their churches? Because, it, let's be real, it's a great way to get people to join. The whole point of the Book of Mormon is to bring people to Jesus Christ. Let's take a look at the title page of the Book of Mormon. What is it? 
I'm not going to read it to you, but it says that it's an abridgment of the record of the people of Nephi and also the Lamanites. So, you know, I, I don't know if I would call it a historical book because it, it doesn't really teach history per se. It teaches more of the theology of the people in, in each time. Uh, it's written to the Lamanites, which are a remnant of the house of Israel and also the Jew of the Gentile. Now, we don't know who the Lamanites are. A lot of people presume that they're the Native Americans or that they are Pacific Islanders. But at the end of the day, we don't really know who the Lamanites are. And yes, there are certain tribes that, say, you know, they've done DNA tests that say that um, they have genetics from the Middle East. But we have not been able to point out specifically any particular of the indigenous people definitely were Lamanites. If it actually is a historical book, I don't know exactly where it took place. We don't know who the Lamanites are. So while it's great that this is there um, to be written to the Lamanites, it's hard for us I'm saying all of that to say this. It's really hard for us to take this book to a people that we don't know who they are. Now, the original saints just assumed that they were the Native Americans. And it, it I, I don't know. I, not only do I not know that, 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 that they were right, I highly suspect in most cases that that was incorrect. Um, we know that it was written by way of commandment. So God told these authors to write down their history and told uh, Moroni, I'm sorry, not Moroni, Mormon, to collect that history into one volume. And here's a key here. It was written by the spirit of prophecy and revelation. So then it was written and sealed up, hidden by God, so it wouldn't be destroyed. And they were to come forth by the gift and power of God and to the interpretation thereof. So again, two mentions here of the spirit of prophecy and revelation, right? Um, because what other, what other gift of the spirit is going to help you translate a lost dead language that nobody knows? Uh, for those who don't know, the reason why I say that is because it's written in what is called Reformed Egyptian, which basically means that the Egyptian that they knew, that Lehi and his family knew and taught their children, in, as languages do, evolved into something else over time. Uh, okay, so a seal by the hand of Moroni, a hidden up into the Lord to come forth in the due time by way of the Gentiles. So Joseph Smith translates it. Uh, again, interpretation thereof by the gift of God. So um, we can easily presume that that is referring to the spirit of prophecy and revelation. And that there's also uh, an abridgment of the book of Ether, which was abridged by Moroni and not Mormon. So that would be a, a book of, of Moroni. So the key things here, when it comes to the purpose of the Book of Mormon, you know, let's, let's, let's put the Lamanites to the side because, again, we don't know who they are. But... Uh, and by the way, this is just the first paragraph of the title page. But we know that this was given to us. Um, let's see here. The second paragraph says, that is to show the remnant of the house of Israel how great things the Lord has done for their fathers, that they may know the covenant of the Lord, so that they are not cast off forever, and then finally, this is this is the key. This is where, I, I, again, I don't know for sure. I think it was Grant that said it. The convincing of the Jew and the Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself in all nations. Now, here's the issue. You give somebody a book. You, you don't have plates to study. So you can't, you can't do any archaeological work on these gold plates, right? Joseph Smith didn't physically use them to translate them. He used, whether you want to say he used a rock and a hat, he, he, I, I, I do believe that he used the Urban Thumb and the, the glasses and chest plate, at least for the 116 lost pages of the Book of Lehi. But my understanding is that he did not get that back. So the book one we have is translated by the rock and the plate. Either way, everyone says that there was a screen, there was a cloth. And so he didn't, he didn't pour through the plates like you see in artwork. He, he did it through what we would call magical means. I would say that he divined the Book of Mormon, which in the 18, early 1800s, science and magic were, were separating at that time. And, and uh, I say that not as in like scientists were all atheists, but I mean, they were getting away from the magical worldview. And so because of that, there were people who would use this term translate in a magical way, which is when, when the, the, Latter-day Saints use this term, they don't mean it the same way as someone speaking Spanish and they're translating it into English for the person that can hear 
And then when the person speaks English, someone else is translating it in Spanish for the other person to understand so that we can have translators communicate back and forth. It isn't like someone's taking a book that's written in French and translating it into English or an, an anime where you see, you know, someone, you hear them speaking in Japanese, but then there's a, a sub below in, in English. That's, it's not the same thing at all. This was done through the power of God. And it says that over and over again, which isn't, isn't just this gift of tongues through reading. It is the spirit of prophecy and revelation. He was receiving revelation to do this. And prophecy here I would use to describe as the testimony of Jesus Christ, as John mentions in the book of Revelation. Here's now I'm, I'm gonna I've said before that these Sabbath service messages are supposed to be the milk and that the um Thursday thoughts can be more of the meat, but I'm going to get into some meat here because I, I think this is something that we as Latter-day Saints really need to understand. I believe that the Book of Mormon is a key. When it says that that um, the angel, which we believe is Moroni in, in the Book of Revelations, you know, sends forth his trumpet sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with the world, what is that gospel? Well, let's look at Jesus asking his disciples, who do you think I am? And Peter says, you, you know, you're, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. And Jesus says, you're right. And this is the rock that we're going to build. You, you only know this because God told you. The Holy Spirit told you. He had the spirit of prophecy and revelation that told him that Jesus is the Christ. And Jesus said, this is the rock that we'll build upon. Some people think that rock is literally the mountain that they're standing on. Some people think that it's Jesus. Some people think that it's Peter. As Latter-day Saints, we have a different understanding of that. We believe it's the revelation, the spirit of prophecy and revelation that allowed Peter to know in a special way that Jesus was the Christ. Brothers and sisters, this is the message right here. I, I've spent 14 minutes now talking to get to this message right here. The Book of Mormon is a key to unlock the spirit of prophecy and revelation. The same spiritual gifts that told Peter that Jesus is the Christ. And we have to have that to build the kingdom. Otherwise, we are just a, a, a church of men because we're just people talking about different philosophies, different theologies. We need this, this key unlock. This is Mar Moroni was sharing the gospel, blowing a trumpet to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the whole world. That is him unlocking this key so that we, as Israel, can be a prophetic people, can be the prophetic people that the Lord called us to be. I've had several people ask me, we're an ecumenical movement. Do we have to have the Book of Mormon? Well, no. We're an ecumenical movement. It, it's definitely a part of our canon. If someone comes in and says, I believe in the Bible, I believe in everything you're doing, but I just, I just don't know about this Book of Mormon, can we welcome them? Absolutely. But in my mind, they can't truly be a part of the Latter-day Saint movement unless that spirit of prophecy and revelation has unlocked inside of them. Now, I'm not saying the Book of Mormon is the only way to unlock it, so people can join and still have that spirit of prophecy and revelation. And because of that, they can join and eventually, I'll testify to you that they will know that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God and is a testimony of Jesus Christ. Because eventually, if they have that unlocked already, they will receive that knowledge through the spirit of prophecy and revelation. And so as they worship with us, as they work with us, as they hear the Word of God as presented through the Book of Mormon, they will know. I genuinely believe that. But what I want you to understand is when you share the Book of Mormon with other people, 
the missionary work you're doing isn't leading people to a church. Even if you're saying, I want you to read this book, and I want you to come and check out the, the Fellowship of Christ. You're doing two things there. You're trying to unlock the spirit of prophecy and revelation, and you're trying to introduce them to an ecumenical movement. The Book of Mormon will unlock the spirit of prophecy and revelation. But that spirit of prophecy and revelation won't necessarily lead them to the fellowship of Christ. Because they truly have the spirit of prophecy and revelation, and they listen, and they follow the instructions of the Holy Spirit, and they'll go wherever the Lord needs them. And that may not necessarily be here. So, brothers and sisters, my message to you today is let's take the Book of Mormon at its word. Let's not just see it as some book that we can look at and read and study and use to fight with each other like, like many Christians do with the Bible. Let's use it for what the Lord gave it to us for. To unlock that spirit of prophecy and revelation. To be a prophetic people. To carry with us as special witnesses our testimonies, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's my message to Sabbath. And I leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, it's another a week coming up and uh, we've been recharged with the, the sacrament. And uh, Wednesday night, we managed to get Mark on the prayer meeting. <laughs> so there's four of us now, so we're hoping to get more. So we, we'll have to try and get Kyle on as well. So. so that was good, and we had a lot more people to pray for. So, yeah, if you want to know more about the fellowship, uh, which is a the Church of Jesus Christ in Christian Fellowship, the the um, website address will be shown on the screen. And we welcome many different people with different faiths who come together in a fellowship and uh, are at one in fellowship. And this is what we want in the world. We want all churches to get on together, you know, we have one thing in common in the churches and that's Christ. So if we can all be like him and have compassion for one another, we can uh, we can work out together and we can create peace in our world. So I'm going to ask Kyle to close in prayer. Over to you, Brother Kyle. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask thee to bless all our brothers and sisters in Christ, that their day may go well, that they come to no harm, that they will always that they that they will always be with them and watch over them. I also ask them to remember in their prayers all the suffering of this world, that it may come to an end, and people may find peace and happiness, love and joy and compassion for each other. And I say this in the name of our Saviour. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Shalom to you brothers and sisters all over the world and it's, it's bye from me. Shabbat shalom. Yeah, and it's bye from him. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>